Thank you very much, Mike, for your extremely kind and generous introduction. Thank you all for being here today. It's a tremendous honor and pleasure for me to deliver a keynote address here in this stunning setting to such a distinguished audience. In honor of the organizers of this remarkable, and in, order of this, and in honor of this remarkable venue, I would like to try to say a few words in Italian. The intent really is to send one of the messages key in mediation about cultural awareness, cultural sensitivity, and the importance of just making the effort, even if we're not perfect. So leave perfectionism aside, we'll never achieve the impossible, as uh, Mike sort of uh, mentioned, I live by the motto of the theater of the absurd and um, challenged by the impossibility, making it a possibility. So I'll, do give, I'll give it a go and do forgive me, Italian locals, for any mistakes. Ringrazio tutti voi e tutti coloro che hanno collaborato all'organizzazione di questo fondamentale convegno in questa città meravigliosa, che è da sempre stata un punto di riferimento per la storia e, della, e, e la cultura di questo Paese. Ringrazio molto il Comune di Firenze, il, Dugi, il giudice eh, Rizzo, il professore Dei, il console Rapp, il segretario generale Grassi, il dottore Farro, l'avvocato Viciconte, il dottore Focardi, e il, eh, Leonardo Basilichi. E un mio, grazio, un, mio, un mio grande grazie particolare va infine alla dottoressa Tondini della Camera di Commercio per tutto il suo ruolo, durante la il ruolo e tutto il suo aiuto durante la preparazione di questo convegno. Grazie Chiara. E... E è un grande onore per me poter intervenire alla Global Found, alla Global Found Conference, che rappresenta un'occasione un un fondamentale a livello mondiale per diffondere l'importanza dei metodi alternativi di risoluzione dei, dei, dei conflitti. Questa è anche un'occasione straordinaria, poiché ci troviamo in questo splendido e storico teatro della città, anch'esso punto di riferimento per la cultura musicale di questo Paese, in cui hanno avuto luogo le prime rappresentazioni italiane di eccezionali opere, fra, opere fra cui Parisiana de Desde di Gaetano Donizetti e il Macbeth di Giuseppe Verdi. Proprio in questo splendido teatro, 27 anni fa, da studentessa presso l'Istituto Università Europeo, ho assistito alla bellissima commedia Il Papa e la Strega di Dario Fo. Avevo ricevuto un biglietto per quella rappresentazione dal mio professore all'epoca alla Badia Fiesolana, Antonio Cassese, un grande esperto proprio di mediazione, inter di mediazione internazionale e premio presidente del Tribunale Penalo Penale e e della Corte Internazionale per l'ex Jugoslavia, di quale sento molto la mancanza dalla sua prematura scomporsa nel 2011. Questo mio intervento vuole anche essere un tributo a lui e a una figura che è stata fondamentale nei miei studi qua in questa città e nella mia formazione come avvocato dei diritti umani e mediatrice dei conflitti internazionali. Grazie Antonio. Di Dario Fo ho sempre ammirato, oltre al suo ruolo artistico e letterario, il fatto che egli non abbia mai avuto paura di contestare le convenzioni e che abbia posto al centro del proprio impegno e della propria produzione l'obiettivo di dare una voce ai più deboli e agli oppressi. Questo per noi qua, facendo la mediazione, questo ci ricorda proprio i principi fondati del concetto di mediazione, in campo pubblico e anche in camp nel campo internazionale. E, ciò, e cioè il fatto che sia molto importante rispettare ogni individuo, non importa il suo background, Ogni azienda, non importa se la competizione, in ogni settore, sia pubblico sia privato, e trattandoli allo stesso modo. Questo è il tema su cui vorrei concentrarmi oggi. È uno dei temi, non l'unico tema. E adesso parlerò della mia 
lingua madre, a little bit on my mother tongue. Thank you for listening to my Italian. I'm quite moved to be here in this venue. Um, it's 27 years since I was last here. I'd like to address the Global Pound Conference goals focusing on the new, in, in the context of the new world disorder, post, which posts new threats and new challenges, focusing on the need for enhanced public and private sector for cooperation in the field of appropriate dispute resolution, ADR. The times we're living in when geopolitics and geoeconomics are in such turmoil require new thinking and new actions, also in the ADR sphere. All of us here in this room have a role to play, no matter how small our organization is, no matter what nature of the dispute is, in the context of globalization and in the context of such insecurity, every single individual has a duty, not just a role to play. The Florence Chamber of Commerce asked me to speak about my experiences and the lessons learned from the public sector for the private sector. Uh, I'll be very selective and only discuss what I can do in what I can discuss in public, despite the fact that we're that this meeting is under Chatham House rule. The success to most of the most important mediations that I took part in have been their secrecy. Some elements can now be revealed, with the Iran deal, for example, having moved into the track one sphere. I'll go and explain exactly what that means just now. Others, as uh, Mike mentioned particularly dealing with organizations considered terrorists by, their, by governments and EU terrorist lists and stuff, are slightly more sensitive, some of course ongoing, and maybe not so appropriate to discuss with 100 people in the audience. Nevertheless, I'm also speaking on the last session, so Q&As um, are very welcome, plus I'll be here during the day, coffee breaks and the like. Just a point about terminology. In my field, the public international uh, the law field, track two means back channel negotiations, as Mike referred to earlier. They're both mediation and negotiations. Um, you know the difference, I won't go into that, but it is just important when there's a track two, the idea is to mediate between parties that governments cannot talk to directly because they're on a terrorist list or because they have no diplomatic relations. So there are people like myself and others who convene meetings with a very select group of uh, people just like the mediations in the private sector. Uh, and once we make sufficient progress, they move to track one and a half. That means that the government or an official representative comes as an observer. They're not intervening. They just sit there to understand what the context is. And once that moves forward with the green light of governments, then it can move into the track one sphere, which basically means official negotiations out in the open, and we can read about them in newspapers. The background work, and I'll just give some concrete examples, also of some wonderful Italian groups who've done this work. The background work is done by mediators like yourselves. The lessons learned from my sector, from the public sector to your sector, to the private sector, and the lessons learned from private to public, we're dealing with identical themes. I had lunch with Michael yesterday and suddenly said, but this is exactly what we're doing. And that's the idea, and that's what we're discussing today. The Global Pound Conference Series, as you well know, is intended to encompass all forms of dispute resolution, including litigation, arbitration, conciliation, and mediation. The series considers how disputants in civil and commercial conflicts can select and have access to appropriate dispute resolution processes that will continue to respond to the user's needs and will also be proportionate in terms of costs, time, possible outcomes, um, their enforceability, their impact on reputations, relationships, and all other social and cultural issues that may be the user's concerns. The Global Pound Conference goals include developing ways to save time and money in commercial disputes, which we'll, of course, um, get into in more detail through the, throughout the day, hearing from leading companies about their needs. Likewise, we're going to address this later. Cutting edge developments in dispute resolution. We can discuss um, those, the interactive conversations, the wonderful core questions and the electronic voting, networking with leaders. We have plenty in this room. Improved access to justice, which is what we're discussing, also in the context of public, private, and where the system of global justice is moving. and gaining a local perspective, which naturally will be the contribution that hopefully this address can make. Focusing on the global perspective is important because it is very closely interlinked 
interlinked with all the other goals mentioned. The fabric is so interwoven that we can't really dissect it. A few words about my work and why I think this is relevant and important. I've been working in dispute resolution in the public sector, having also delved in and out of the private sector for many years, having qualified as a lawyer in the private sector, and now injecting momentum from each sector into each other. The purpose of this address, in some ways, is to bring the sectors closer together and to have bring, help bring some understanding of how the systems work. I've always been struck by the similarities in mediation in both sectors, and I strongly believe that more interaction between uh, private and public sectors, especially at this uh, political time of tremendous threat and challenge, is absolutely vital. It's, um, it is my core belief that dispute resolution is vital to achieve a healthier, saner, more equal, and more prosperous society. Both international conflicts and private ones can stem from cultural misunderstandings, competing interests, personal frustrations, and a sense that injustice prevails. In order to help the parties address these issues, uh, which are common to both sectors, a host of complementary skills and aptitudes are required. These include expertise on the nature and the scope of the dispute in question, cultural sensitivity in languages, um, profiling, appropriate choice of mediator or mediators, we'll speak a little bit about the benefits of co-mediation in, uh, in complex cases, a choice of venue, and much patience. I personally was exposed to conflict from a very young age. It's part of my um, makeup as a person. It's in my blood. I grew up in Jerusalem. I sat in bomb shelters as a child. Every family I knew on both sides of the conflict had lost either a member of the family or someone very close to them. Um, and conflict engulfed the entire region. Um, there lay a host of issues incl including deep insecurities, misperceptions or different perceptions, um, different narratives and different beliefs, and of course, real injustices, not just the perception of injustice. All these issues need to be addressed in mediation. All these issues are part of what makes a mediation successful or not, looking into the root causes that cause the parties so much distress. In the quest to achieve access to justice, appropriate dispute resolution, be it in the public or private sector, needs to become center stage. It is no longer an alternative. It is vital. It is the way forward. Throughout my career as a human rights lawyer, be it in Gaza, the West Bank, Haiti, Guatemala, the, the Balkans, where I worked with the United Nations or the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, I felt there was always a limit to what human rights lawyers could do. Courageous activists challenging oppressive regimes were often detained without trial, tortured, and in the case of Bosnia Herzegovina, murdered. There's a real genocide. When I was in Haiti, the number of deaths of disappearances, which are basically tantamount to death, was high. As a human rights lawyer, we could docu document the violations, we could seek justice in the lo local courts, in a range of tribunals, but it did very little, ultimately, to resolve the conflict. I still view myself as a core, as a human rights lawyer. My commitment to human rights is absolute, but I concluded fairly early on in my career that in order to help resolve conflicts, it was necessary to look at the root causes of them, study the history, the political context. In commercial cases, it's the history of the dispute, it's the context of the dispute, and um, the, the economic issues, the security issues, Study all the players involved, their personalities, the, why, they're, why they're so frustrated, why they feel injustice has been done. It was then important to build up a mediation team with all the relevant expertise to appreciate the depth and scope of the dispute at stake. Um, a media, a, the appointment of a mediator that has to be 100% neutral um, takes time. It's not just a question of the mediator's qualifications. It's a question 
of their background. It's a question of how the party views them. In that sense, the parties should have all the information, uh, all the information that uh, the choosing enterprises has about why this particular mediator would be the best one to resolve a conflict. I'll run through, because I have five minutes, through the lessons learned um, just in bullet points. Mediation requires re rigorous research and preparation. You need to do your homework properly, otherwise it doesn't work. You need to study the culture, you need to study the business culture, and you need to carry out an assessment on whether the mediation is likely to succeed. Consider arbitration or conciliation if mediation does not seem appropriate. Um, mediation wasn't appropriate um, for one of the first cases I was involved with, the Taba um, dispute that stemmed from the 1978 Egypt-Israel Peace Accord. Um, the peace accord, the landmark peace accord, still stands between Israel and Egypt, failed to resolve the issue of where the border lies between Israel and Egypt and Taba, where there was a five-star Hilton hotel at the time, uh, two kilometers uh, south of Eilat, at the tip of the, um, the south of Israel on the Red Sea, was an area of dispute. Mediation was not um, called for, it probably wouldn't have resolved the issue, and we sat in Geneva, a team of uh, five arbitrators. I was an um, assistant to one of the key councils at the time, and a team of over 20 lawyers on each side. So that goes into the other case. We'll go into sizes and how, how big a delegation should be and at what level of seniority. We should make sure that there's some sort of parity between the different sides of the dispute. Culp cultural sensitivity, knowledge of terrain, rigorous research, patient, patience, a neutral venue. I'd just like to give the example of the wonderful Italian NGO that brokered the peace accords between Renamo and Frelimo, the first of the two warring factions in the Mozambique Civil War after seven year, 17 years of war. I choose Sant'Egidio not only because we're in Italy, but, but it was one of the most formative experiences for me as a human rights lawyer turned mediator as we were working on the case. The accords were signed in Rome. I start from the end, I start from the good part. Uh, in October 1992 by the UN. Um, the real work was done by a small NGO, the Comunità di Sant'Egidio, who had knowledge of the terrain because they were de delivering aid during the years of the conflict. They chose very wisely their mediators. They chose one local mediator, the Archbishop, who was a Vatican appointee, and he was the Archbishop of Beira, the second largest town, in Mozambique, and they chose one very seasoned Italian senior diplomat and two of their own, uh, we call them do-gooders, basically the people who don't have a political agenda but just want to deliver aid. In that case, two years of mediation, so you need to have a lot of patience. The venue was Rome, so you know, not a bad uh, choice for people coming from Mozambique. Neutral um, and very laborious. Um, for me, it was one of the better um, experiences to show how small NGOs doing small things in a small, they started by delivering aid to the poor population in the outskirts of Rome. So it wasn't very different to some of the members here in the audience that deal with very, very small local issues. The stage is becoming international. Managing the party's expectations is very important. Um, consulting extensively with the parties. Managing the party's concerns. A lot of time to listen about, to listen to what they have. Level of participants, so we discussed what happened in Taba, that was in arbitration, but the same principle goes for mediation. In a recent uh, mediation on the WMD free zone, that's the weapons of mass destruction free zone where all the states in the Middle East are a part of, including Iran and Israel. Uh, mediation was held in Glion, which is a small town uh, um, on Lake Le Mans, or just above, in Switzerland. Many of the successful mediations are held in Switzerland. This wasn't necessarily successful, it's still unresolved, but it's uh, 
It was a very, very important hearing. One party sent somebody very senior, the other party sent people who are junior. The message is very clear. Those who are sending junior people are more skeptical. It just requires more work. Number of participants are very important. Should be an equal number. Ruling out capitulation, very important. Parties are new to a process. They need to be reassured that they're not capitulating by agreeing to take part in a mediation. I always say in my work, talking is not the reward. The reward is when you have a deal. Talking is just the first stage. And that's why talking to terror, terror, it doesn't matter who you talk to. You need to talk to everyone. You don't talk to people, you can't get anywhere. So if people ask me, oh, how can you speak to these groups? You know, and they all kill us. I said, oh, we don't understand what their ideology is, what their motivations are. You know, the prize is not by talking to them. The, uh, it's not really a question of a prize. It's a win-win situation if you reach an agreement. It's a lose-lose situation if you don't talk to them. Venue, neutral. Florence is a fantastic venue. There's a new center here, the um, Florence International Mediation Center. Perfect, nice room with a view. Neutrality is, of course, very important. Um, helps put the parties at ease. This is very, very important. Team building. So I don't know how many uh, mediations people here have been involved with where you need an expert team. But often with multi-party um, mediations, parties in different states, it's very important to do some cultural profiling of the company and the country because the culture is so diverse in so many places. So I, I, I just uh, take the time because all the mediations that I've been, the, the, the mistakes are when you don't take the time to build a complex team. Co-mediation, like the case of Sant'Egidio, four mediators, many others, very important. Um, I'm finishing, Jeremy. The future of, AGR, of, a, of ADR. As I said, alternative, no longer really an alternative appropriate dispute resolution. Given the current global crisis manifested by Today, hung parliament in the UK, who would have thought, snap election was called, may have thought that she would uh, win outright. Uh, a bomb, bombing is in London in the last week, bombing in, bombing in Tehran in the last week, severing of diplomatic relations between all the GCC, the Gulf states and Iran. North Korea um, testing new missiles that can reach the US. We've got a huge, huge global crisis uh, looming. The, sector, the public sector and the private sector really need to join forces to try to, help these, um, to try to help these conflicts. The UN have a mediation support unit um, with tremendous expertise. The EU, likewise, humanitarian dialogue. Um, we have plenty of organizations. I just say, let's work closely together to help make this world a better place. Thank you. So, um, we need to get to work, all of us today, to try and fix things, public and private sector working together, as Nomi has just said. And um, to do that, I need you all now to put on your thinking caps, because this is the time where you all get to work today. Um, just a quick word, I want to thank our global sponsors. And I just want to also invite the uh, Council from the Chamber of Commerce to add a few words. Buongiorno, sono l'avvocato interno della Camera di Commercio di Firenze, quindi sono formalmente un avvocato di parte in tutti i sensi. E quindi ricordo eh, i vantaggi della mediazione e che richiedono che ogni avvocato debba avere, a mio avviso, il cuore, perché secondo me in tutte le cose bisogna avere cuore e farle con passione. E la mediazione è una di quelle cose che, se fatte con passione, riesce veramente bene. Bisogna avere il cervello, perché secondo me è anche una scelta intelligente. Bisogna avere anche gli strumenti per poter fare tutto. È per questo che eh, anche nelle scelte più importanti di cuore o di passione bisogna avere gli strumenti. E ringrazio chi ci ha dato gli strumenti che ci, hanno che ci hanno aiutato a realizzare questo evento, che è un evento unico per la giustizia. E sono gli sponsor che vedete qui. E, mh, gli sponsor a livello globale e anche locale. <coughs> In particolare ringrazio due sponsor che sono qui, che sono PwC e Genius SRL, che hanno proprio dei prodotti per la giustizia. In particolare hanno una linea che si chiama eh, Forensic, specializzata nella prevenzione, anche in questo caso, e nel supporto tecnico in materia di litigation, e anche la Genius SRL. Entrambi i loro banchini sono nel foyer e vi invito a visitarli veramente. E hanno anche degli strumenti che si chiamano Tool Big Data, che serve al monitoraggio dei contenziosi da remoto e forniscono la possibilità di avere dei vantaggi organizzativi, gli strumenti di cui vi parlavo, per tutti i professionisti. 
potendo visualizzare da remoto in tempo reale tutte le cause civili di cui si è parte e gestire online tutti gli atti e adempimenti richiesti. Ringraziando tutti gli sponsor vi invito veramente a fare mente locale su ciò che ci può aiutare a focalizzarci sugli strumenti veri di ricerca sul nostro cervello, lasciando quello che si può lasciare agli strumenti ai professionisti che ci aiutano. Grazie molti, arrivederci. So thank you and thank you to our sponsors. And now um, to get on with our work, um, you're probably all wondering why the global pound. It has nothing to do with Brexit or the pound sterling. It has to do with the gentleman whose picture you see on the bottom left, uh, whose name is Roscoe Pound. And Roscoe Pound uh, is best known as a thinker, a philosopher about law. Um, he was the dean of Harvard for many years. Um, but he started in 1906 his career in the US talking about justice and whether there was proper access to justice. And in fact, he came up with the idea that if the systems available do not correspond with the needs of the population, there is no justice. Uh, it is not only that justice delayed is justice denied, uh, but it is uh, also the quality of the justice that matters as well. And um, there was a big conference in 1976 in his honor. That was the original Pound Conference. And we are now 40 years on we started last year, um, trying to take this at a global level. The 1976 Pound Conference changed the situation in the United States where they were having a serious problem with their justice systems. And everybody recognizes the changes that came about from that conference. Um, and the idea is today to think in that same way, looking at the global uh, economy, how things are handled, are we ready to really be able to provide the appropriate services that companies need when they are doing um, any sort of commerce today, whether it is domestic or international? We are in a digital age. Can we respond on time and the right cost? Uh, also dealing with not only the financial and, and uh, chronological issues, but very much also the relationships that are required in an intercultural uh, planet. So these are the questions that we were looking at. And one of the big things that came out in the 1976 conference was data. There was no data. And that's the quote you see on the, on the right-hand side. Frank Sanders, who's a very well-known uh, professor at Harvard at the uh, Negotiation Institute, the PONS, the, um, the Center on Negotiation Studies there, was talking and lamenting the absence of objective data. What we are trying to do with the Global Pound Conference is do precisely that, bring together stakeholders from all the communities. So we have five stakeholders, and you are all amongst them, hopefully. Uh, you are either a user of services, um, or you are an advisor, which is typically a lawyer in, in many cases, but not only we have PwC and other experts who provide services. The third category is what we call adjudicative providers. We put judges and arbitrators in that group together. Um, in the fourth group, we have non-adjudicative providers, and we've put conciliation, mediation, and ombudspeople together in that group. And the fifth group uh, are extremely important because they are the influencers. They're the people who shape how people educate, think, and practice uh, um, access to justice, whether it is law students, all the way through to government officials and policymakers. So these are the five groups, and the whole idea is that you are at tables together, discussing this amongst yourselves, and providing us with your data. How do we collect the data? It is basically done through the application that I'm going to run through with you. We are far behind time, so I need to try and do it much faster than I normally do, but I know that I'm in Florence, and I know you get it veloce, so it will be good. Um, so how do we collect it? We have four conversations today. Each one will last one and a half hours. In each of those conversations, we're going to be collecting data from you in a way that makes them both actionable, so that we can do real actions in local cities, and comparable, so that we can compare the same apples to apples, in a way, um, comparisons between cities around the world. And we will be doing this um, by generating data in six ways. There is delegate information, and I will ask you please to all make sure that you did fill out your delegate information. It is very important for our statistics. If you didn't have the time to do it so far this morning, please do it during the lunch, Uh, or at the break, uh, if there is, you know, later on one uh, during the day. Um, let me ask the most important question now to all of you. Does anybody not have access to the internet and has not been able to access uh, the Wi-Fi system so far? Please raise your hands. We have uh, Livia over there, 
um, and other uh, people will hopefully come running uh, to help you. So if there's any, please raise your hands now if you're having any you know, problem with access. Can use their computers too. It does, it does, it's not so office. if your telephones are giving you a problem, there's also your laptops or your iPads. Any electronic device you have that has access to internet uh, will be able to work. All right? So please raise your hands high. Uh, but I'm going to assume that you are all connected and it's working well. So you'll see we have then multiple choice questions. And we'll do a test right now. Uh, there is a word cloud that we'll also be doing. And then it will be discussions between you. And the discussions are really important. And I want to highlight this. Even though we have panelists, and the panelists will be having conversations amongst themselves, you are part of these conversations. And the way in which you participate in these conversations is by sending comments and questions that you like up. If you like it, you vote on it. Because it's your votes that are also going to influence the panel we'll talk about. So you are also shaping the conversation as it evolves. Um, and this is very important data for us for afterwards when we collect and analyze everything. And your voices will join approximately 2,000 people, as Mike said earlier. So uh, again, we're not looking for, this is not a mediation conference. This is a dispute prevention and resolution conference. And we are looking at all forms. So if you are more an arbitrator, more of a litigator, uh, you do many different things, all the better. And what we are also going to invite you today to think about is not only doing one or the other, but thinking of ways of combining them so that we can offer people a full range of products that relate to their needs and choices. Um, so what you should have by now is you should have been able to find and locate the Wi-Fi. And uh, you have the password. And you've been able to go into gpc.powervote.com. Please could I ask you to do so now. Uh, if any of you have not been able to do so, please could I ask you to um, raise your hands now. OK, it seems that you're all able to do that. So I'm going to do now is I'm going to go into this. And you should see the app um, the way it is on my screen. I'll try and make it a bit smaller um, so that you can see it uh, a bit more easily on a smaller size. All right. Now, how does the app work? You have, if you don't see the column on the left, please click on the three bars you see up there. And that will pull down the blue menu. The blue menu is how you find everything you need to find today. So you'll see, first of all, I asked you, did you fill out your delegate information? That's where you go and you fill that out. It's six questions. It will take you four or five minutes to do so. Um, then when you want any information about today, you go to today's event, this button over here. I'll click on it now. And you'll be able to see at any stage where you are, uh, you'll be able to see um, so I need to refresh the application, it seems. So I will do that now. Oh, and I'm having the internet problem. So I need a technical person to come and help me here because my um, computer is not, does not seem to be uh, doing this. But if, any, if you can go and do that, please, then you will see that you are able to um, hopefully But it seems to be working for everybody other than me. I'm not using their system here. I'm using something else. Um, so um, does anybody have any? Well, let's try and see what it works like. So in that column, please, in the menu, you'll see that the top is all information about today's event. And when you click today's event, you'll see the agenda. You'll see the speakers. And you'll also be able to access the results for the voting today. All right? Now, if you go further down that blue column, what you'll see is something called test questions. La colonna sinistra, test questions. And we'll try and do the test questions now. I'll just use them in the same one as everybody else. So what you'll see there um, are two types of test questions. There's the core question and there's the word cloud. I'd like to do the core questions test first. So please raise your hands if you've had a difficulty finding the test questions. We have one person over there who's had difficulty finding the test question. Um, Mike, could you, and I think it's being helped. Um, anybody else having difficulty asking the test questions? Giovanni De Berti uh, and over there. So if I could ask your neighbors maybe to see if they can help you first. 
but we have two people having difficulty with the test questions. And I'll be able to show it to you in a moment, I hope. So this is Eroto. Um, so what I'd like you to do is do the core questions first. And you'll see it's a question, first of all, when you, it will ask what stakeholder group are you in? All right, I'm going to download it and I'll be able to show it to my screen, I hope, in a moment. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> So if, if you can put your stakeholder group first, and please use the same stakeholder group throughout the day, because we want to make sure that you're not, you know, some of you have many hats. You sometimes are arbitrators, sometimes lawyers, sometimes mediators, sometimes teachers. Please try and th stick to one hat and wear that hat for the whole day, okay? So select your group, and then when you go to the bottom and hit submit, it will automatically take you to a question about breakfast today. We care very deeply at the Global Pound Conference to make sure you have proper oxygen and glucose in your brains to get good data. So we need to know what you had for breakfast today. So you'll see multiple choice. I would ask you to please uh, go in there and select them. Try Firefox, it won't be a problem. Um, and um, then we will try and uh, vote on the, the options. Now, when you click, your first choice, you'll find that there's the number one that appears. That number one means it's your first choice and it means you've given it three points. When you click on the next, the number two will appear, which makes it your second choice, and it will receive two points. And then the third one is going to be receiving one point. All right? Think about it. Um, so, that is um, how it basically works to get the, um, the voting in. If you want to change your vote because you made a mistake, you click on the square again, and then you'll be able to do it um, and, and reorder the numbers. You always have the option of putting other, so although we always give you six options or five options, you can always add other if you do not like it. I seem to be catching up with you now. And what I think I can show you now is, I was t showing the test questions. The core question for the word cloud is here. I will always be voting today as a non-adjudicative provider. I'll make it a bit smaller so you can see the full screen. I'll hit submit. And when you hit submit, it takes you automatically onto the next page. My first choice will be eggs. My second choice will be uh, toast. And my first third choice will be cereal. No, I made a mistake. I change that. I change that. I put toast. I put cereal. And I can now go and vote. And hopefully it works for everybody. There's a repeat in case anybody wanted to practice it again. Uh, but I invite you just to go to the bottom and click on the arrow and you get the final place. Now when you're on this page here, because you've successfully done, so please raise your hands if you're not at this page by now. One person, uh, um, two people. So if your neighbors can maybe in the meantime try and help you. Um, but what we want to do is once you're here, please click on the test word cloud line. All right. If you're having difficulty finding it that way, or you're lost at any stage, you can click on the little home icon or the back arrow on top, and it will take you back to the page you were in. So you can always find your way back. So now we're doing the, or the other way to do it is you click on test questions, you go to word cloud, because we'll do the test word cloud now. Okay, now this time, 
it's the same question about breakfast, but we do not give you any ideas. You are free to write your own words. So please could I ask you now to write in your preferred breakfast or um, what is your favorite breakfast food? And you can write as many lines as you want, but we ask that you write one word per line. If it's orange juice, you might need to do both, you know, both words on one line, but please try and limit your words to one word only. So, um, I like a croissant uh, and a cappuccino when I'm Italy. So I will put that in there. And you can now hit submit. And now you've done the same way of collecting data, but this time you were free to choose your own words. And that tells us what the group and the room thinks much better. Okay? So what I'd like to now do is show you the results of this so you can see how to read the results and to interpret them. So please, you can always go back with a little house on top, go to the very top of your page, and what we'll now do is we'll go back to the test questions, and what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the results. So let's look at the demographics of who's in the room today. So according to this, only 42 of you have voted so far, which means that there are around half of you who are not voting. So please vote. It's really important for us that you all vote. Your data is very important. Please keep your hands up if you need somebody to come and give you some help. Uh, don't be shy about this. Everybody technologically, uh, including myself, it's kind of frightening the first time you do it. But it does get uh, quite useful, and you'll see that it, it happens easily. So please raise your hands, because this number shouldn't be 42. There are more than 42 people in the room today. Uh, so please, I, I ask you all to, to vote again. Um, Forty-four. It's already improving. Um, so where I am, if you're wondering, wondering how to see this, is it's in the test questions. Does anybody need more help? Please raise your hand. There's one uh, person over there. If somebody can help Olivia as well from the uh, FIMC team, that would be very helpful. So what we do is let's look at the results. So you can click here, and you can now see the results from the breakfast question you just voted. So we only have 43, uh, 44 votes still for this. We need more votes, please. And you'll see that the preference for everybody in the room is cereal first, toast second, Eggs third. I'm hearing a lot of uh, discussions in the room. Could I ask you please, and I'll slow down, maybe it's a matter of translation. Is anybody having a problem voting? C'è un problema per votare oggi o va bene per tutti? Por favor, levare la mani, levantare la mani si c'è un problema. Una persona al fondo, por la destra. Um, <laughs> so hopefully being helped now. Okay, so these are the preferences for the results you see for breakfast, which is interesting maybe in itself to know what people prefer for breakfast, but the really interesting thing is when we go a bit further down, or in this case, we'll go back to the top to show you the other screen. I know it's right here. It's the breakdown per stakeholder group. This is how we really look at our data today. Because it turns out, as you will see here, that although we thought cereal was the preferred breakfast for everybody, that is not the case for users. The people who have to eat the breakfast we provide do not like the first thing we are offering on our menu. And that is, in a way, symbolic for what we want to be looking at today. If users want toast first and cereal second, 
then we should be discussing why we're not able to provide that to them. All right? So it's not too important, I think, for access to justice, the difference between toast and cereal. But it might be for the other questions later today. Now, to understand the voting, let's understand what these numbers mean. All right? What does a 67% mean, followed by 58? You'll see they don't add up to 100%. For every answer you give, because three points was the maximum you can give if you voted at number one, we look at every question based on it receiving three points from everybody in the room. Which means that, that means everybody in the room giving three points would be 100%. If this question toast is getting from user 67%, it means that on average, everybody in the room gave it two points. So it's an average of 67%. If everybody in the room had given it one point on average, it would be 33%. So the data in a global pound conference can still mean something at 33%, because it means that everybody gave it one point. What we are really looking at is the comparative popularity of each of the answers. So we can not only see what is the most popular, but how far away is the next choice. And we can compare it stakeholder to stakeholder. So that is what the um, cloud looks like, as the, um, sorry, the core questions look like when voted in this way. I would like now to show you what the word cloud looks like. And the word cloud is the final button here. And now, you are in, these are your own words. So yes, we are in Italy, and clearly, people in Florence will prefer cappuccino to anything else. All right? Um, sometimes spelt with two Cs and one C, I notice. That must have been me, the single C. Um, but this tells you what the room is thinking. And that's where the word clouds are so interesting. So when we are in our, in our sessions now, we will always give you five multiple choice questions and one word cloud to do. And what I'm going to ask is all of you, but this time really all of you, to vote in each session so that we can get your votes, because they count very much not only to get statistics for Italy, but to also get statistics globally. So with that, I think I've finished the opening presentation. And what I'd like to now do is invite our first panel to come up onto the stage. To know who's in our first panel, you can go to today's event, click on the agenda. We are going to open now session one. And so, first of all, if we could ask Carlo, uh, who's our moderator for this panel, to come up to the stage. And joining him are Isabel Otto, uh, Josephine, Antonino, or Nino, as I understand, uh, Georgia. So please come up to the dais, and you don't need to get the microphones yet, because, uh, well, actually, it's going to be for Carlo to introduce the rest of you, so Carlo, you need the microphone. Uh, what we will do, and for the chairs, we can do it afterwards during the, while they're out of the room, just to present you to them, but we're first going to vote on the questions with them as well. Um, but first, if you have, Carlo, just a few minutes when you're mic'd up to introduce to us everybody on your panel. You don't need to all have your mics yet, because you'll be going out of the room and coming back in half an hour. We need a microphone working, please, for um, Carlo. The what channel, no? Ah. Speak my Ah, Carlo. questo. Questo è bellissimo. Quindi io se parlo vengo sentito? Ah, che bello. Salve. Buongiorno. Uh, allora, eh, lo faccio in italiano? Sì. Just introduce your La maggior comments. parte di noi siamo italiani. Allora, sulla... Do you need... Um, 
Uh, no, we, we're not speaking now. You'll be going for half an hour and coming back. Okay. Just for a minute, just introduce okay. the people. Allora, who they sulla, are. Mia, sulla mia destra, Josephine, uh, I'm going to introduce you. Okay. I'm just going to introduce you. Josephine Wan Wen Han Di Kusumo. Mm -hmm. uh, naturalmente, i, i, i CV, cioè il curriculum, sono sulle vostre app. Quindi, io l'unica cosa che vorrei dire di Josephine, che ho avuto il piacere di conoscere ieri e che mi ha colpito uh, nel suo curriculum. Lei è Senior Counsel di Texas Instruments, così giovane è già Senior Counsel a Singapore. Mi ha molto colpito uh, che ha avuto un premio nel 2007, The Most Outstanding Young, young Person, e, e quello che c'è scritto qui, she firmly believes that education, ah, scusate, crede fermamente che l'educazione e l'avvocatura sociale possono cambiare le vite, can change lives. Sulla mia sinistra, Isabel, guardate, si scrive Hoto con la A, cosa c'è qua? Oh, non c'è. Quindi Hoto, H-A-U, è um, arbitro mediatore indipendente, eh? ma per tanti anni è stato general counsel di Orange. Orange, se dico così. Ok. Uh, e la frase che mi ha colpito è la risoluzione del conflitto attraverso una visione globale e strategica in piena conoscenza delle uh, difficoltà di multifacet eh, che devono affrontare le, le società. Is that a good translation? Ok. E ancora sulla mia sinistra, Giorgia Magno, sono tutte giovanissime questi avvocati, General Counsel Turbo Machinery and Process Solutions, GE, è responsabile per tutte le questioni di compliance, legal and compliance matters. Compliance of my eh, qualcosa che entra nel mondo dell'avvocatura <coughs> e che dobbiamo tenere presente. Quindi grazie Giorgia per essere con noi e in fondo spero che il curriculum di Nino, Anton Nino Cusmano vi sia arrivato, è attualmente uh, vice, vice, vicepresidente del Group General Counsel di una società di trasporti che si chiama CMA, GCM. In precedenza, Group General Counsel di Telecom Italia, forse più nota a noi. E la frase che mi ha colpito in questo curriculum immenso, che troverete spero sul sito, è la basare le relazioni professionali sull'integrità, la fiducia, la discrezione e i risultati positivi. Ecco, vi ho dato una pennellata sui nostri membri del panel. Jeremy, back to you. Thank you. Thank you. So what we'll do now is we're going to vote the questions for session one. So how do we do that? You'll see under, and this is where you'll always find the exercise, at the very bottom of that blue column, la sinistra, la colonna, all right? We do core questions, and you select session one. And it will open a new window. You'll be asked the first time to put in your email again, because that's the way we know who is voting. And then you will be asked again your stakeholder group. So please select the same one and then hit submit. And we, now we have our first of five questions. And the question is, you have it first in English and then in Italian. What outcomes do parties most often want before starting a process? So we're looking at parties and what parties want when they start a process. And it's a commercial dispute. Please remember. So, and again, we ask you to select your three choices. Your first choice will get three points, your second will get two points, your third will get one point. So, if you think that what people want most are action focused results, such as getting an injunction or getting specific performance of an agreement, please press one. If you think that what parties want most is financial, just payment, cash, please put number two as your first choice. If you think what people most want is a judicial outcome, 
some legal precedent or judgment, that's what they really want, then please put number three. If you think they want some psychological closure um, or a sense of being heard, then uh, please put number four. Uh, if you think it's number five, it's more relationship oriented, they either want to terminate or preserve a relationship and that's the most important for them, please press number five or other. You have three choices. And please, when you vote, try and vote as you see things actually being today. It's important for sessions one and for sessions two that we do not vote based on what we hope, but what, on what we see, on what we observe today. When we have sessions three or four, we can talk about the future and what we hope for. Pero per las sesiones uno y dos, por favor votaré como la situación es adesso de manera objetiva, su, su, uh, ob, su ob, 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 observación, all right? And so please select your, um, your choices. And once you've done that, go to the bottom, and you can then uh, hit um, your last choice. It hit submit, and you'll get on to the next question. And you can do this at your rhythm. The next question, and I won't try and read the Italian, when people are choosing the type of process to use, and again, we're looking at all processes, litigation, arbitration, mediation, conciliation, what has the most influence on a party's choice? So please put uh, number one if you think it's advice from a lawyer or another advisor. Please put number two if you think the expectations of confidentiality are the most important thing in selecting a process. Uh, please put three, efficiency, which is about time and cost, if you think it's that the most important. If you think it's the industry practice that's the most important, please select option number four. If you think it's the predictability of the outcome, please op go for option five. And if it's relationships, again, keeping or um, ending, but preventing an escalation of a relationship, uh, um, of a conflict, please press number six and you always have other. And if you're ready, we can go on to the next question. So the question number three is, looking at what lawyers are recommending to their clients. And the question here is, when lawyers make recommendations to parties, which of the following do you think has the most influence on the advice the lawyers are giving? All right, so please select option one. If you think the most important thing for them is the familiarity with a particular type of process. Please select two, if you think it's the norms in the industry. And please select three, if you think it's the impact on the costs or the fees that the lawyer can charge or save. Please select option four, if you think that it's the relationships that the clients want to maintain that is the most important thing when the lawyer is giving advice. Uh, or five, if you think it's the type of outcome that the client says to his lawyer, here's what I want to achieve. If you think that the lawyer adjusts it based on every case on what the client is asking for and changes his advice according to the request, that would be your first choice and you have again other. And if you've been able to do that question, 
And again, if, you, if you're not keeping up, please do it at your own rhythm. We'll go on to question four. The question here is, what role do parties involved in commercial disputes want providers to take? So you've hired a provider. What is the role you want the provider? And what we are looking at here is a question of, do you want them to control the process only, or the outcome only, or both the process and the outcome, or neither, you want them to facilitate, but you want to keep control over both the process and the outcome, or you don't know. You've never really thought about it, and you would like the provider to walk you through your options and guide your choice on what that means to control process and or outcome. So please select number one if you think the, the parties should decide everything, both process and outcome. Please select two if you think that the providers should decide the process but the parties keep control over the outcome. Please select three if you think that the parties choose the process, but the providers decide the outcome. That might be, for example, a case of a certain type of arbitration, where you select the arbitration, control the process, but the tribunal is the one that gives the result. Please select four if you want the providers to decide everything, both the process and the outcome. And five is that option I mentioned before where you really don't know and you want some guidance at the beginning of the case. Which might mean that although, although you've started litigation or arbitration, you would still want the provider to talk you through your procedural options rather than assume this is all you want to do, litigate or arbitrate or mediate. Yes? So the questions might appear to some of you to have similarities, but we've been through this again globally, as Michael said in his speech, and worldwide. We're trying to, to have questions that are um, the same. So options two and four, maybe as a matter of translation, they come across the same, but they should not be the same. Option two is the provider decides the process and the parties decide the outcome. And all the same, the three Italian version, two, three, and four. Oh, two, three, and three. Well, it looks like there's the problem with the Italian. The English is correct. The problem seems to be in the Italian translation. So apologies for that. So just be very clear about that. For two, the providers decide the process and the parties decide the outcome. And for four, it's the other way around. Sorry, uh, th I'm sorry. For four, it's they decide everything. I'm sorry. The providers decide everything. The Italian transition is okay? So I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, does that answer your question, sir? You okay? Okay. So we can now move on to the, uh, the next question, hopefully, for everybody. No, the providers decide the process the, and the, the parties decide. How to make footage video. It's our footage. It's okay. No, it's not the same. It's okay. So, um, and finally, we have um, the last question for the session, question number five. And the question is assuming that lawyers will be present in the process, what role do the parties want the lawyer to have? We're not talking about the role the lawyers want to have. We're talking about the role the parties want the lawyer to have. Okay? And so there are five options here. Please give it number one if you think that's your first choice. It's acting as coaches. They provide advice, but they do not necessarily attend the meetings or the proceedings. Number two, they act as advisors and come accompanying the parties to the proceedings but do not interact directly with the other people present. Number three, they participate in the process by giving expert opinions, 
but not acting as the main representative for the parties, not acting on their behalf. Number four is they work collaboratively with the parties to navigate the process. And that may request actions on behalf of a party, but that's not always the case. And number five is the more traditional role that we think of lawyers sometimes, speaking for the parties or advocating for them, being the principal representative for the party in the process. So that would be your first choice if you think that's what the, the clients usually want. And then we finally have another option that we do not want lawyers at all involved. So parties do not normally want lawyers involved at all, and you could select that one if you think that is the case. And select them in your order of choice. And if you've done and that included the voting, and Carlo, if your panelists have all voted, and you're all ready with your votes, we now invite you to go and discover the results. You can look at them under the results for today's event button. And there's a little room in the back, and I'm hoping Carol can guide you to the little room in the back, which is a very comfortable room. A euphemism is for small, but a lot of history to it. And we'll see you in half an hour when you're ready to come and discuss your results with us. And while our panelists are in the room now looking at the data, we are not going to look at the data yet. Okay, I need all of you to work on something else while they're out of the room looking at the data. Thank you and see you. And if you need less time in half an hour, come back and join us whenever you're ready. Whenever you're ready, but half an hour maximum, please. All right, so we now have work to do. And what we're going to ask you to do is, although you're sitting at big tables with many people, we would like you to have conversations in groups of three. So that you're really able to get to speak to the neighbor on the left and on your right. Because we want to now do with you, are having, you know, we want you to have discussions amongst yourselves and to answer some questions and to give us the answers to your discussions. All right, so how do we do this? Please click on the button here that is discussion questions of session one. That'll bring you here directly. And if you've got lost somehow and you haven't found the page this way, you can always find this at any stage by clicking in the full menu button. And now we are doing what is called the discussion questions. You'll see them on the bottom here. So you can click on discussion questions session one, and you'll get back to that same screen. Okay? So we are now doing the discussion questions. I'll make it a bit bigger so you can see it a bit better this time. We are clicking on the discussion questions and discussion question one. Now here's the first thing we ask you to do in your groups of three. Please put in your email addresses so that we know who is in your group because we'll be correlating all of this afterwards to your delegate information. So in your groups of three, one of you should act as a rapporteur. You don't all need to fill this out, but one of you should, normally the person with a laptop or an iPad, it's easier, um, can write the data for your team of three. So please put in the emails first. And when you've done that, you have around five minutes to discuss each question. And then to summarize, just in some bullet points, your findings for each question. So you just put the emails of the three people in your group. The one of you who's acting as the reporter does this. And now we ask you to discuss, first of all, and in five or seven minutes I'll come back and ask you to move on. We just want you to have a discussion on an inexperienced user. What defines an inexperienced user? And what words can you use to describe what an inexperienced user wants? So that's the first question here. Inexperienced parties, please. 
So I have five minutes to discuss it, and your rapporteur will write some notes.